So before we start, just a reminder about some genetic terminology from GCSE. Starting off with chromosome, um, and that's made of DNA. The gene is a length of DNA that codes for a protein or a characteristic, we say sometimes. Then there's the locus. Now the locus is the, the location, the position of a gene on a chromosome. Then we have allele, a different form of a gene. Then the term homozygous is used when a person has two alleles for a gene that are the same, like big T, big T. Whereas heterozygous, here an individual possesses two different alleles for a gene, so big T, little t. Then, what this leads to is the greater the variety of alleles that exist for a particular gene, then the greater the genetic diversity. And this means that there will be a greater variation of the feature that's controlled by the gene within the population, and so a greater variety of genetic differences between the gametes that are formed by members of a population which means that when the gametes meet, you're going to get a wider variety of appearances of the offspring. So, one of the key things in all this is the size of the population. If you've got a small population, then there, there will be fewer alleles, fewer different allele combinations possible. And this often shows up in the appearance of that population. So here we've got two individuals. They're actually the bongo. You can see they look remarkably similar to each other. Here we've got another example, Hartman zebra. And again, they look remarkably similar to each other. They have a very small gene pool. There are not many different alleles in that population. We'll say more about that later, but this can have its problems. So how is the genetic diversity calculated? Well, you look at a, a population, um, humans obviously, and some dogs. Um, we recognise these all as dogs, even though they have very different features, very different to the bongo, which look very similar. Um, humans, very similar, but they do have lots and lots and lots of differences. Difference in colour, difference in, in height, difference in skin tone, etc, etc, as we know. Now, one thing that um, we need to remember is that if a gene has more than one allele, it's a heterozygous gene. And so we also refer to the locus, remember that's the location, is also described as heterozygous. So what we could do is a simple measurement of genetic biodiversity by calculating the number of heterozygous loci or heterozygous genes are in a particular individual. So, you know, how many big T, little t's and things like that. But the thing is that that will only tell us about one individual. It doesn't tell us about the whole population. And so it is not a good measure. It's not a good measure of the whole population as a genetic resource. It's only telling us about one individual. So say this dog here, it would tell you about him or her, but it won't tell you about everybody else in that population. So a better measurement is to calculate the percentage of the loci in the population that have more than one allele. So a percentage of the humans, a percentage of the dogs or the wildebeest, that these are here. Um, and so let's take an example. So if you've got a species then that has got um, 15,000 loci or 15,000 genes, that if two and a half thousand of those have more than one allele, then the genetic biodiversity can be calculated. And to do that, you use this equation here, where you simply have the genetic diversity is equal to the number of loci with more than one allele divided by the total number of loci in the population and you multiply it by 100. And so in my example above then, that would mean that we would get here you can see 2,500 divided by 15,000 times 100 gives us 16.6%. 
And if you were able to do that with a variety of different populations, so populations of a species in one part of the world and another part of the world, then you could compare the biodiversity between species across the planet. Because remember, the population size can have a dramatic effect on the genetic diversity of the species. Okay, so just to finish off, just say a little bit about polymorphic genes, polymorphic gene loci. Now, polymorphic gene loci, quite simply, and the term you use when a gene has got more than two alleles. So we describe it as a polymorphic gene. And the more alleles you have for a particular gene, then the more this will increase the genetic diversity. Now, there's one example that you will know from GCSE, I think, um, which is the blood group system, the ABO blood group system. So you may remember that the blood groups are A, B, AB and O. And just keeping it simple for now, we'll just say there are three alleles for the gene for blood group. And these are A, B and O. Now, O is recessive. O is recessive to both A and B. So A is dominant to O, B is dominant to O. But A and B are co-dominant. And this means that if you are going to be blood group A, then your genotype, you can either be homozygous or heterozygous. So big A, big A, homozygous, big A and O, heterozygous. Similarly, if you're blood group B, you've got the same options, big B, big B, and B and O. Then, this time though, for AB, because we said that A and B are equally dominant to each other, they're co-dominant, then here, the genotype can only be of one type, AB, and for blood group O, because we said that's recessive to both, then that means that you can only have one genotype, which is OO. Now, the more alleles that you have for a particular gene, the more diversity you're going to get. So for this, what you do is you use a very simple formula again, where we've got the proportion of the polymorphic gene loci, um, working that out. So it's a number of loci divided by the total number of loci. And this means that basically, the more different alleles you're going to get for a particular gene, then the more genetic diversity you're going to get. And I hope that was helpful.